Amen. God bless you. Listen, we're, we're almost finished with this series. We're, we're in a series called Unstoppable, and here's the premise if you're just joining us. Times are tough. Times are confusing. In some ways, it feels like the entire world has been flipped upside down. And many of us are feeling frail. Many of us are feeling frantic and faithless. And some of us, we're just plain angry. We're so angry that we're losing focus. And my, my premise is, beloved, there's no reason to be in that kind of state. There's no reason for you and I to be hopeless or helpless. Now, Pastor Patrick, I like you. You seem like a decent gent, but are you not paying attention? Have you not seen the breaking news? Well, yes, I have. Have you read the good news? Hmm. He's preaching already. He's not even three minutes in. This whole series is really about speaking God's strong eternal truth to the Christians who are, who are being tied in knots by the urgent but temporary news of the world. And if you notice, there's been one thing that I've, I've said over and over again. There's one basic truth throughout this whole series, and that's this. God is unstoppable. And because God is unstoppable, his word is unstoppable. And because God is unstoppable, his love is unstoppable. And this morning we're going to talk about this because God is unstoppable, his church is unstoppable. I'm going to spread this message over two weeks. This morning will be part one of two. And the text that we're going to look at this morning, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, is in Matthew 16, 13 through 19. I want to give you a little context before we, we walk through these verses because quite a lot has happened. By the way, I'd like to say good morning to our neighbors over there sitting out there joining us. God bless you. We're so good to have you here. Amen. If you need communion, somebody will run over there and give it to you, okay? All right, God bless you. So in Matthew 16, Jesus has asked two questions and made one statement. But before we get there, let's kind of walk through what has happened so far. In, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus' real uh, first public appearance happens when John the Baptist is baptizing the crowds at the River Jordan. Uh, John the Baptist is speaking truth to the, to the spiritual leaders of that day and age, and he's baptizing many crowds, preaching the kingdom of God. And Jesus shows up one day, and John looks at Jesus and says, wait a minute, hold on one second. You need to baptize me. How am I baptizing you? Now, remember, this, this is happening while there are crowds around. Now, th they must have been a little confused as, as John has kind of grown in some authority, and, and they're watching John, and they're watching Jesus, and, and they're, they're listening to this, this conversation between the two. And it seems that publicly John is deferring to this man. Well, wait a minute, wait, wait. Isn't that Mary and Joseph's baby? Oh, well, we know it's Mary's baby, you know, because it has some controversy around his birth, but you didn't hear that from me. John then baptizes Jesus, and the, the heavens open up, and a voice comes out of the earth. A, a, the Spirit des descends on him in the, the form of a dove, and lands on him, and a voice comes out of heaven and says, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, the crowds have to be thinking that's a little crazy. That's a pretty awesome first public appearance. And the next place we, that Matthew puts us publicly is Jesus walking along the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And he's watching these two fishermen, and he calls them to come follow him. He calls Simon who is Peter, we'll get to him in just a second, and his brother Andrew. And he then calls another set of siblings, James and John. He then takes his disciples and begins to go throughout Galilee, teaching, preaching, and healing. And then the crowds really start to take notice of him. In the parlance of today's youth, he 
blew up. Tons of people began to come around him. And this is when life around Jesus starts to get a little crazy. Jesus then goes on the mountain with his disciples who had already decided to follow him and with a crowd who were just curious about him. And then he presents to them probably the most staggering discourse in the history of mankind. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus continues his ministries, the disciples and the crowds in tow. He's traveling around doing more teaching, preaching, and healing. And along the way, he calls more disciples. And by the time we get to Matthew 10, he's got 12 total. And all together, this this, this, this merry band of, of followers around this central figure begin to travel around healing people, preaching, teaching, rebuking even the Pharisees. And these people, these disciples around Jesus begin to see him do some crazy things, stuff like uh, feed uh, 10 to 15 to 20,000 people with a snack, walk on the water. And all that happened and much more. And I can only imagine what it was like for the disciples to walk with Jesus who had called them out of their mundane lives and to join this rocket ship. To hear him, to watch him. I'm talking from his inner, his inner circle, to watch him speak to the crowds, to see him perform the miracles, to watch him, uh, how the people responded to him. To have quiet times with Jesus, who could look deeply in their eyes, speak directly to their souls. I can only imagine what their private thoughts might have been if there's such a thing as private thoughts around Jesus. What do they really think about this man who went from curiosity to celebrity? What do they think about about this man who, who, who started on the seas of Galilee, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden, here he is, a walking miracle. He's a phenomenon. What were they thinking about this man? And not only what were they thinking about this incredible man, what are they thinking he's up to? What is he doing here? Matthew records this conversation that we're going to read here in Matthew 16, 13 through 19. It says in verse 13, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, and, and Caesarea Philippi is about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's near the Mount, uh, Mount Hermon, and, and it's, it's on the boundary of the Gentile world. It's primarily where he's at right now, where he's brought his disciples. It's primarily a Jewish, a, a Gentile city. They are outside of their Jewish surroundings. Now, here's a spoiler alert. In just a moment or two, we're we're going to see that Jesus affirms uh, Peter's revelation concerning his identity. My thinking is this. Is the fact that Jesus confirms his identity in a Gentile region sort of him nodding to his vision of a multicultural, multinational discipleship plan? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But he asked his disciples this. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man is a title that Jesus most often uses to identify himself. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But what he's doing, he's asking the disciples, okay, you're here, and you've heard what people are saying about me. What's the scuttlebutt? What are the rumors? What what are you hearing through the grapevine? What are they saying about me on Twitter and Instagram? What are they saying? And what the people are saying about Jesus is impressive. Verse 14, and the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, powerful man of God who stood up against the religious establishment, who preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. In fact, Herod, who had John killed, when he heard about Jesus' fame, he actually believed that Jesus was John come back from the dead. Ooh, that's a, that's, that's a powerful man to be compared to. Others say Elijah, a powerful prophet of God and a worker of miracles. And others, Jeremiah. Apparently some, some, some saw Jesus as a man of sorrows 
and that he somehow uh, resembled who they called the weeping prophet Jeremiah. Or, Peter continues, one of the prophets. What's clear here is that the people think very well of Jesus, and they've pegged himself as someone sent from God to be called and to be compared with the likes of John the Baptist, Elijah and Jeremiah and the other prophets. It is high praise indeed, but it's not high enough. And then the question comes as Jesus transitions to a much more important question. He says to them, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? You've been with me for some time now. You, you remember, some of you, when I got baptized with John, I called a few of you pretty early on in, in, in this ministry. Some of you came along when, when, when there was a lot of popularity around me. But you've been close to me. You're not out there. You're in here. You've watched me. You've listened to me. You've been directed and corrected by me. You've spent nearly every waking moment with me. So who, who, beloved, who do you think I am? 16, Simon Peter replied. Now, first of all, Simon Peter just going to reply. He's going to be the first to say something, anything. It might not be anything good, but he's going to be the first one to say something. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. It means uh, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I find this interesting because, because Peter gets the revelation about Jesus while with Jesus, but not from Jesus. For some reason, and not given here in the text, God chooses to give old foot and mouth Peter this amazing revelation about who Jesus is. And I wonder, I wonder if it's because Jesus has, Peter has watched Jesus and began to emulate him. As Jesus has gone off and prayed by himself to the Father, I wonder if, if Peter has decided, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to go off and I'm going to spend time with the Father. And I wonder if in one of those times, God reveals to him this amazing revelation. I'm not sure what it is, but Jesus affirms, Peter, my daddy that's been talking to me, ooh, he's been talking to you too. And that truth, the truth that Peter utters right there, it's the very foundation of your identity and my identity. Verse 18, he, he says this, Jesus says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. When Jesus uses the word church here, it's the word ecclesia, and it means gathering. It comes from the verb, literally meaning call out from. It was used in these ancient times in various ways in this first century. It could refer to any gathering of people for any purpose. It, 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 it could be used in the case of a gathering of believers, in this case around Jesus as the central figure. Now this verse has been hotly contested throughout the centuries because some believe that when Jesus says this, that he is literally building his church on Peter. Others believe that, that Jesus is going to establish and build his church on Peter's confession. And by building his church on Peter's confession, Jesus is going to build his church on himself. I am among those who believe that Jesus is not establishing the church here on the person of Peter, but rather the revelation and the confession of Peter. I believe that because Peter himself would later write in 1 Peter 2, 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him, in him, will not be put to shame. Peter there is, is quoting Isaiah 20, 28, 16. Now, do you believe that, that Peter is quoting that Old Testament text and is somehow suggesting that it's fulfilled in himself? The answer to that is no. He's saying that that text is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote 
Ephesians, around the same time, he seems to uh, make the same point. He writes in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, he says, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and po uh, prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. In him, he says, you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. No, Jesus is not building his church on Peter. Neither is Jesus going to build his church on what the disciples say that other people outside of his community of faith is saying about him. No, Jesus is not going to build his church on what people say about John the Baptist. He's not going to build his church around some mistaking identity with Elijah or Jeremiah or any of the other prophets. And by the way, Jesus is not going to build his church on your favorite preacher. He's not going to build his church and is not building his church on a popular personality. And for the love of God, he ain't building his church on Patrick Davis. If, if God built his church on me, we are all in trouble. Instead of having fire shot up in our bones, we'd walk around hot messes. That's what we'd be. No. Peter's confession speaks to the uniqueness of Jesus. Jesus is not John the Baptist. Jesus is not Elijah. Jesus is not Jeremiah. Jesus is unlike anyone who has come before him or will come after him. And that is important. That couldn't be more important because a church that does not have Jesus at the center of its beliefs and practices is not Jesus' church. And if Jesus is not building that church, then the next part doesn't apply to it. He goes on and says, verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Or literally, the gates of Hades. Hades and its Jewish counterpart, Sheol, is a word that refers generally to death and the power of death. And some have argued that Jesus here is also eyeballing demonic activity as well as death and the power of death. And Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates in these, these ancient times are where the, the courts were held, where business transactions occurred, where the principal players could to gather together to plan and to prepare. And Jesus is saying that no power, no plans, no plots will ever prevail against those who are gathered around me. Not even death itself has the strength to stand against my saints. For even when I die, what I'm going to do is rise again. And when I rise, darkness will be defeated. Dark powers will be defeated. When I rise, death itself loses its power. That even when my people, those who are part of my church, gathering, community, even when they die, they won't stop being my church because they'll just rise with me in eternal union with me. Jesus is saying, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And then in verse 19, he says this, and I will, I will, something interesting, he says, I will give you the keys, he's talking to Peter now, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You ever wonder why every joke that talks about getting into heaven starts with Peter standing at the pearly gates? This is why, right here, this is why. In fact, I, I feel one coming on now. <laughs> so a pastor dies, and I hate this joke already. <laughs> a pastor dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates. And ahead of him is a guy dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, a leather jacket, and some worn jeans. 
And St. Peter addresses this guy and he says, so that I can know whether or not to admit you into the kingdom of heaven, please tell me who you are and what you did. The guy replies, how you doing? My name is Joseph Fina. My friends call me Big Joe. I've been a New York City taxi driver 25 years. That's not bad for a New York accent, huh? From a brother from California, that's not bad. St. St. Peter consults his list, and then he smiles, and he, he gives the taxi driver a couple of pieces of articles. He says, here, please take this silken robe and this golden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. And then St. Peter says, okay, who's next? And the pastor, oh, the pastor, who had been watching this situation, he steps forward, stands erect, and he proudly proclaims, I am Michael David Johnson III. And I have been the senior pastor of First United Calvary Baptist Church for 47 years. St. Peter consults his list and he says to the pastor, okay, here you go. Please take this cotton robe and this wooden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. Just a minute, the pastor says. That man was a taxi driver in New York City, no less. And he got a silken robe and a golden staff. How can this be? St. Peter said, up here we go by results. When he drove, people prayed. <laughs> and when you preached, people slept. <laughs> I don't like that joke. Wake up, please. Okay, here's what the text is saying. This whole binding and loosing thing has been an interesting, it's been interesting to watch people wrestle with this over the years. Here, here's what Jesus is saying. This binding and loosing were concepts used in the daily life of the Jewish people. Uh, it was really about the administrative process of applying the law to circumstances and decisions of their lives. This was about a Jewish person coming upon a cir cir circumstance or situation or a decision where they're trying to figure out what should I do? How does the law apply here? Uh, what should I do in response to what the law may say about this particular thing? So to bind or to loose had to do with, with, with what's okay and what's not okay. Um, commentator William Barclay, he wrote this concerning binding and loosening. He said this, quote, their regular sense, binding and loosing, which any, Jewish, uh, any Jew would recognize was to allow or to forbid. To bind something was to declare it forbidden. To loose was to declare it allowed. These were the regular phrases for making decisions in regards to the law. Now, I would encourage you, just like the Bereans, to do your own research on this, but here's what I think Jesus is saying. You guys have lived with me and you have seen me operate on an intimate basis. You know the way I move. You, you know how I think. You know my thoughts and what I taught. And based on my teachings and my will, I give you authority to permit an action or deed or to prohibit an action or deed amongst the believers who will be my community. All right, Brother Patrick, that was great. We got some few verses. That was fantastic. Uh, well, it was okay. <laughs> I'm still awake. But so what? W what does this mean? Why did you walk us through these verses? Honestly, I just had one goal, just one goal this morning. And that was to encourage you to be encouraged, to stay encouraged, to fight discouragement. Many of us feel like the church is under attack. Many of us feel like the church is in danger of being shut up or shut down. But I'm here to tell you that the devil is a lie. The church is in no way going away. Now, how could you be so confident of that? Because of what Jesus is saying here. Because of, of everything he's telling his disciples right here. Let me, let me summarize and paraphrase what he's saying to Peter and his disciples in these verses. Brothers, I'm going to establish and I'm going to build my new community of followers through you. And nothing in the heavens, on the earth, or in Hades is going to stop me. And guess what? 
He's 1,000% right. Well, how do you know? I'm glad you asked. Do me a favor. Children, close your ears. Is the baby sleeping? Okay, I want you to honk quietly if you can. <laughs> if you're here this morning, honestly, if you're here this morning and you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, do me a favor. Give me a quick honk on your horn. That's how I know. Because 2,000 years later, 7,377 miles away from that area, in a church parking lot, we are honking our horns to show our allegiance to the same Jesus. That's how I know his church is unstoppable. Now, okay, hold on one second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And so how did all of this happen? Did it happen because... Uh, did it happen because uh, the saints of God were, were so amazingly perfect? It absolutely did not. You know that's not the truth. Was it because they, they, they didn't experience persecution? Absolutely not. The church was persecuted, but it kept going. Amen? Was it because, was it because well, the, the church gets along in, in the midst of other brothers and sisters is such harmony and peace? Lord Jesus. I wish that were true. No, it wasn't. In fact, Paul's drumbeat constantly was, brother, stay united. Brother, stay united. Brother, stay united. Why? Because they struggled with it, and we still struggle with it today. What, what was it? Why was it? How did this happen? How did the church persevere to this point? And more importantly, how do I know? How am I so confident that the church is going to continue? The answer to that is in the title that Jesus uses to describe himself. Remember, I told you I'd come back to this. Do you remember how Jesus described himself, the title that he used to identify himself? The Son of Man. That, that title comes from the book of Daniel. At a time when, when uh, the Jewish people were in captivity in, in Babylon, Daniel, who himself was in captivity, he has a vision from God. And in this vision, almighty, victorious God is sitting on his throne. He's called the Ancient of Days in Daniel's vision. And in his vision, in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, da uh, Daniel witnesses something or rather someone glorious. And this is what it says, verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, with the clouds of heaven, came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, this Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. See, I know that the church is not going anywhere because I know who Jesus is. I know because Jesus is distinct, because Jesus is holy, He's majestic. He's the Messiah. He's the bright morning star. Jesus is wonderful counselor. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Brother Brandon, I know that the church will carry on because Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the good shepherd. I know it because he's the vine. I know it because he's the way, the truth, and the life. I know it because he's the Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I know it because Jesus is the Son of Man who has been given dominion and glory. I know it because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on who I am, the great I am. I know it because God is unstoppable. And because God is unstoppable, his word is unstoppable. And because God is unstoppable, his love is unstoppable. And because my God is unstoppable, his church is unstoppable. Amen. Amen. That's how I know. So as we prepare our, our hearts for communion, 
Let me just say, this is not just true of the larger church. This is also true for us, Series Christian Church. Next week, we're going to be celebrating 113 years of God's faithfulness. So next week, we're going to talk about not just the history of the church, but our history as a church. And we're going to encourage ourselves and remind ourselves that God ain't done with us either. Amen. See, the movement of Jesus' community all began with his disciples. Jesus had come on the scene and turned their lives upside down. Jesus had called them. Jesus had challenged them. Jesus had confronted them. He cherished them and he changed them. Near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we find the disciples eating the Passover meal with Jesus. They don't know it yet, but their lives are about to take even more twists and turns. They're about to experience incredible lows and remarkable highs. And through it all, God would use a small group to change the entire world. But before all of these hard and amazing things would take place, Jesus gathered them together to eat the Passover meal. And he took that opportunity to anchor something deeply into their own souls. In Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, Jesus said this. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after breaking it, after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take eat. This is my body. They, they soon would see Jesus' broken body. And when they saw their Savior, the water walker, the miracle worker, hanging from the cross, beaten and bruised, they would remember that that sacrifice was for them. Before we take the bread, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your body. Be glorified, my Father, in the taking of this bread. We do this remembering that that death was for me. It was for all of us. We should have been the one paying the penalty of our sin. But you declare that you would be the one who would be a substitutionary atonement for us. Thank you for your body. We take this in remembrance of you. And when he took the cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. They would also see, in a very short amount of time, Jesus' blood shed. And when they see this blood, they would remember that it's because of the shedding of that blood. They have been made clean. And as you and I take this today, we are reminded that in Christ's blood, we have been made clean, holy, acceptable in his sight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the blood you shed. You have made us new, clean, alive in your blood. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. God, as we take this now, Lord, may there be a rejoicing that, that wells up in hearts all over this place, that you've forgiven us, that we're forgiven, and we have a new covenant in your blood. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let us take the cup.
thank you for promising to be there for us, God. You haven't forsaken us. You are by our side, Lord. You are within us. So God, pray for boldness. Pray for um, strength as we continue forward and walking in your word. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Kiana to come up here and also all of the elders. humility, um, your generosity, your kindness, your love, your grace. There's going to be something I want to take with me and um, wherever I go. And so thank you for teaching me. Thank, thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> um, and and um, I'm going to continue to develop and grow as a disciple of Christ. And um, I pray that the same prayer that you just prayed for um, the church, which has no time span. We've had the pleasure, the joy of being with you here at this church. You are, we had the pleasure of welcoming you in and of being part of the lifeblood of this church since you were a baby. And you too, as far as I'm concerned, Kiana, you're still kind of a baby to me. Cause Don't shoot me high. <laughs> We've prayed together, uh, we've served together, we've encouraged one another, we've lived life, we've served Jesus together. I know for me personally, it's been a pleasure and a joy uh, working with you over the last year and eight months. And I think it's going to be my joy and pleasure as we send you forth, unleash you unto the world. Maranatha and Kiana are following the call of God for what God has them next. And I would ask the, the elders to come around and lay hands. Don't lay hands on Kiana. <laughs> lay hands. Is that okay? But you got the baby, so. <laughs> lay hands on them. I want you guys to take these, these shirts off and wash them immediately when you get home. <laughs> I want to give you guys two blessings. Two blessings and a charge. Hmm. Many of you know that Maranatha is a foodie. <laughs> this boy loves food. There's not a restaurant in town and for 300 miles that he's not, no. So I would first like to bless you with a hunger. I want to bless you with an insatiable hunger for Holy Scripture. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and sh active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you too will get in and stay in the word of God and allow it to change you, you will always glorify God in all that you do. Also, I want to bless you with an unquenchable thirst for prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always and pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. No matter what, 
if you stay in the posture of prayer, Abba will always love you and lead you. And now I give you this charge. It's out of 1 Timothy 4, 14 through 16. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. And here's the last part. Keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. Saints of God, would you raise your hands and lift them toward this couple as we pray for them. Abba, Father God, we love you. And we love these two. So God, I, I, I gather myself together here and I do what I believe you're calling me to do. I speak blessing upon this couple. Lord, as they go, let them be instruments of your power, of your presence. Speak through them. Change lives through them. Save God through them. Father, as they go, put your hand of protection and direction upon their lives. Bind them together, this couple. Protect their marriage, would you please. And use their ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. You have to know, you guys, we love you. Um, listen, if you ever feel the need or want to come back for any reason, any time, you are completely welcome here. We love you. We love you. So I want to give you the benediction. I'm going to try to do this from memory because I've been challenged. It's out of Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the grave, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you complete in every good work doing his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Say goodbye to these beautiful people. Oh, farewell. <laughs>